Okay, part six, cracking straight on from 1935. In October, after Mussolini playing it fairly cagey for most of uh, 1935, he finally invades Abyssinia. Trying to create Mary Nostrum, trying to rival the British and French empires in Africa and to fulfil his dream towards greater glory for uh, the Italian nation. That's going to cause major problems for the league. He is supposed to be one of the key players on a permanent member of the council, um, and Britain and France are not going to want to upset him at all. Ooh, let's move it on to 1936. So, in 36, uh, oh, I've missed that key event at the end of 35. December 35, my mistake. After Mussolini invades, you should know that Britain and France are desperate to keep him on side. The two foreign ministers, that's right, their names are Hoare and Naval. They come up with their plan, uh, and that plan says that they're going to leak. They're going to leak. They're going to give two thirds of Abyssinia to the aggressor. Two thirds to Mussolini, Abyssinia, a member of the League of Nations, being sold down the river so that they can keep Mussolini happy. That is going to be a disaster for the reputation of the league. Never comes into effect, but the details are leaked to the press and the credibility of the league is flushed down the toilet. And Britain and France look suitably embarrassed having tried to work outside the league and it's a massive uh, example of them shooting themselves in the foot. By the time we get to 36, oh, we're up there, 36 already. Um, one statistic for you. The Gestapo in 1936, they broke up 1,000 underground socialist meetings. It's a good prompt for you to make sure you understand as much as you can about the Nazi methods of control, the level of opposition, why there was not much opposition in Germany. You get loads of questions on that. Um, there was opposition, but it tended to be low level and it tended to not be very successful because the Nazis were so good at breaking it up. So that's a good statistic to um, remind you of that. Another topic which you can't, doesn't fit on the timeline very easily is the idea of culture and media. Perhaps the best case study you do on that is the Berlin Olympics and the, the great propaganda triumph the Nazis believe it to be. Although Jesse always does his best to ruin that. Um, make sure you understand how the Nazis used culture, how they used mass media. Make sure you understand about taking over of the newspapers and Goebbels shut down all but a thousand of those by 1944. Make sure you understand the Reich Chamber of Culture. Loads of examples that fit into one neat year, but the Berlin Olympics is a great example of how they use culture and technology to uh, push the message of Nazism. Um, other policies that Nazis are following around this time, policies towards women, uh, there were 30% more births in 1936 than there were in 1933. You guys have to understand why Adolf Hitler tries to get women out of the workplace, back into the home, producing as many kids as he possibly can, um, and how he does it, and how successful those policies are. You will need to know that stuff it doesn't all fit neatly into a year on the timeline. Uh, let's go over the other side. So you can see uh, Hitler's foreign policy starting to really come to fruition. In March, having seen the feeble efforts of the League to try and stop uh, Italy and not sanction oil, not close the Suez Canal, Hitler marched his troops into the demilitarized zone of the Rhineland. Still German, it had always been German, but now it had German troops in it, which was forbidden by the treaty. Another way of him stepping on the treaty and ripping it up. Phenomenally popular in Germany, again, boosting his confidence and, and boosting his reputation at home, keeping German people happy. The Abyssinian invasion is still going on. The capital falls. As you're obviously, you're great geographers and you know the capital is Addis Ababa fell to the Italians. The Emperor, Haile Selassie, has to flee. A 
and he goes to Geneva where he gives a heartfelt speech to, to the members of the league and talking about where's the collective security that was promised to me, what are you going to do about the naked aggression against my country um, and again it's another shocking body blow to the League of Nations. In fact AJP Taylor said in this whole scenario, the only quotation I'm really trying to make anyone learn at GCSE, AJP Taylor, at Abyssinia, the real death of the league was in December 1935. Cracking quotation, showing the disaster of this, this time period. Um, just to finish it off, just to rub salt in the wounds, the Brits and the French having tried so hard to keep Mussolini away from Hitler and basically pandered to him throughout the whole of the crisis and not sanction oil, uh, end up losing him to the fascist uh, alliance anyway. And that, by November, is the signing of the Rome-Berlin Axis. And you start to get an alliance formed there that's going to push the world to war by 1939. 1937, that axis of the Rome Berlin becomes the anti Comintern pact. That's anti communist international. And they add one more nation to that, it's going to make up the axis powers. So Italy and Germany join forces with Japan to publicly state they are enemies of communism and to restrict the expansion of communism and uh, declare that Stalin is their enemy. Why the Nazi Soviet pact comes as such a shock to so many people a couple of years down the line. Um, we've also got, uh, I missed 1936 as well, go back up a little bit. You can also have the outbreak in 36 of the Spanish Civil War, where General Franco, the fascist leader, is trying to take over Spain, being resisted by an international brigade and people uh, rallying around the communist group against him as well as the, the royalists of, of Spain as well. This is where Hitler's going to test out the Condor Legion and sharpen the Luftwaffe's uh, readiness for the Second World War. It's the most famous example of this, although Mussolini does send troops as well, but it just sends the Luftwaffe uh, and that's the bombing of Guernica that gets turned into a very famous picture by Pablo Picasso and becomes one of the key reasons why the Allies are so desperate to appease Hitler and try and avoid war, because the bomber will always get through what Stanley Baldwin, the Conservative Prime Minister, said. They were terrified that the war would be brought to the civilian population in a way that it wasn't in the First World War. 37 is when the Japanese extend their invasion of Manchuria. They took a bit of a breath after 1933 and they invaded mainland China. Some historians will give 1937 as the start of the Second World War, and the Japanese start to rampage down uh, throughout Southeast Asia, desperately trying to grab as much oil as they can um, before the Americans cut that supply off for them. And that is pretty much the end of 1937. Got nothing for Germany for 1937. You got something? Stick it in there okay. and, uh, and tell me, because clearly I'm not doing the job well enough. 1938, getting close to the war, getting close to the finish on this side of the course here. Um, in March, it was emboldened by his early successes. He's gambled with the Rhineland, he's gambled with rearming. No one stopped him. It's where you see, what are the Allies doing? Well, they're just appeasing him. And this is where Hitler takes the next gamble and he annexes a culturally similar country, somewhat culturally similar country to Germany, country of his birth, Austria. Make sure at this stage you are fully up to speed. You see some examples of the Anglo German Naval Treaty, you see the sympathy for Germany coming out in ideas like that. By the time you get to 1938, really, this is more about a desire to prevent war. A peace. You must know the reasons why it's followed. You must be able to judge how effective a policy it was. And it does delay war. But was that any good benefit to the Allies whatsoever? At least Hitler still absolutely rampaged across Europe by the time he gets to war in, in 1939. 99.75% um, of the Austrians voted to um, join Germany and achieve the Anschluss, although most of those are watched by the Nazis when they're casting those votes, so it's another cracking Nazi trick. By the time you get to September, Hitler's taken over Austria in a completely botched invasion as well. It was a complete palaver. They had to 
uh, buy like road maps from the petrol station and they ran out of fuel on the way and uh, it was a complete disaster but it was it was successful the Nazi machine was not quite ready for war at that time by September Hitler's got his eyes on Czechoslovakia he starts threatening war if he doesn't get it and our friend Neville Chamberlain he's on the board somewhere is he on the board no he's not he might be on your sheets meets Hitler three three times right at the end of September he flies to Munich comes over this piece of paper with his high scratchy voice mew, 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 says it's peace for our time and believes he has avoided war and is treated like a hero an absolute hero by the British public and the British press when he comes home because the Brits are so desperate to avoid war um, that's supposed to uh, give up the Sudetenland to save the rest of Czechoslovakia we'll see if he's successful um, the Sudetenland is taken over in October 38. On the home front in Germany, you've got something my class always loved, the Lebensborn programme, that's actually what it's called rather than some of the names you guys tend to give it, where uh, racially pure ladies could donate a baby to the Fuhrer by being impregnated by racially pure SS men as well. Uh, this is desperately trying to lift the birth rate because women are now going back to work, filling the roles that the men have lot left as they've gone off to join the military forces. And Hitler's trying to achieve two aims at the same time, but conflict can't really do it. Um, you might remember, this is a good thing to prompt your memory about the church, and what the Nazis wanted to do with the churches, and how well the churches opposed the Nazis. A good example of that is Martin Niemöller. He's sent to a concentration camp in 1938 and of course the, probably the most famous example of 38 in Germany the 9th and 9th of November that is Kristallnacht the night of broken glass make sure you can tell me why that happens I think that's a question in the mock actually quite tricky to get two reasons on that uh, make sure you can tell us about the results Kristall and the impact. Actually, most of the German people don't like it, and Hitler starts to just ease off on the open persecution of Jews at that time, do it a bit more in secret. Um, we're now right into the eve of the war, we're going into 1939. By this stage, you've got 82% of Germans involved in the Hitler Youth. Good time to remind yourself and say, okay, well, how well do I know the policies? on youth? Do I know what the Nazis did, why they did it, how they did it? Do I know the equivalent of the Hitler Youth for, for girls? Do I know what the activities they got involved in at the time? Um, to make sure you know the purpose and the methods of Hitler Youth and how effective it was. There's a great question about how effective Nazi policies were towards young people. There are going to be opposition groups which we'll mention shortly. Um, you've also got by 1939, 70% of households own the radio that couldn't pick up foreign radio stations. Remember the name? That's the People's Receiver. Great way for the Nazis to spread their propaganda. And if you didn't have one of those, you were probably hit by one of the 6,000 loudspeakers they've got out and about around Germany. Um, nothing specific I've got for Germany at that time in 1939. But two key events, having promised he wouldn't make any further territorial demands, and once he got to state land, Hitler quick flats that March 39, he invades the rest of Czechoslovakia. Sold down the river, its main defences and armaments given away, such as the Skoda Arms Works in the state land mountains and the three million Germans in there. Um, clearly he could not be trusted anymore, which leads to the British guarantee for Polish independence, knowing that Poland would be next, and the Brits and the French could not possibly take one more step back, otherwise we lost all credibility. In August, Hitler and Stalin stunned the world, Molotov Ribbentrop Pact, otherwise known as the Nazi Soviet Pact. You guys are shocking on this in the mock exam, definitely need to know it better. It's a non-aggression pact between Hitler and Stalin, which basically makes the Second World War inevitable. They agreed to split Poland up in secret, but openly they said they were not going to go to war with each other for 10 years, which led the 1st of September, 1939, to the invasion of Poland. 
start the Second World War and 15 minutes. 